think of Nintendo, one of the game genres that I usually never associate with them are shooters. That all changed when, during E3 2014, Nintendo announced that they were creating a third person shooter called Splatoon. The game is one of the more unique shooters because it doesn't follow the usual first or third person shooter mechanics of winning by kills. Instead, the main focus of the game is to spread ink in order to widen your team's turf as much as possible. It doesn't matter whether you're playing Turf Wars or the competitive ranked modes. Covering as much ground as possible with your ink is always one of the main focal points of any match. Though, I've been wondering recently how this game even became a thing. I mean, making a third person shooter where you shoot ink to cover territory isn't something you can just make up in one night. Also, despite the updates it got throughout the years, how many beta elements are hidden in the game's files? Well, hold on to your tentacles because today on the beta files, I'll be talking about the beta of Splatoon. The game was developed at the Squid Research Lab, or as us humans call it, Nintendo of Japan. Hisashi Nogami, more famously known as the producer of the Animal Crossing series, got together a team of 10 developers at Nintendo's Entertainment Analysis and Development Division. He announces to his small team that they should start searching out unique and new gameplay ideas by creating prototypes. One prototype created by programmer Shintaro Sato caught the attention of the team. Nicknamed the Tofu prototype because of the giant blocks looking like tofu, Sato created a game where the objective was to ink the ground as much as possible, and later added a mechanic where you can hide in your own ink to avoid battles. After the team played with the prototype a bit, they tried connecting multiple Wii U's together to create some fun multiplayer team melt between real players. Many matches were held, and the team decided to make the prototype into a full-fledged game. Though, they only made it a game after taking the advice from senior game designers like Takeshi Tezuka and even Miyamoto. Many might believe that the first characters designed to use and shoot ink were squids because of the ink mechanic, but it's actually quite the opposite. At first, the team put Super Mario characters in the early prototype, like Mario and Yoshi. The most obvious reason for Mario characters in a shooter was IP recognition, as Miyamoto himself said during an interview for Edge Magazine's August 2014 issue. When we talked about the possibility of it being Mario, of course we can think of the advantages. Anybody would be willing to touch it as soon as we announced that we had a new Mario game, but at the same time, we had some worries. They didn't go with this option, but it wasn't because Mario shooting people would look bad for Nintendo. Nogami believed that new characters and a new world in general were needed for this unique new play experience. Instead, the first original characters the art team conceptualized were rabbits, because of their territorial nature and having to fight for their turf, so to speak. To make the teams distinguishable, they colored the rabbits black and white and bright colors would be used in order to distinguish ink from the colors of the rabbits' bodies. After showing the rabbit prototype to the various other teams at Nintendo, two synonymous questions were asked. Why would the rabbit shoot ink? And what's the purpose of hiding in it? Known for his works on character designs in The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, co-director Tsubasa Sakaguchi thought of an idea in order to give these mechanics purpose. The players would be given the ability to move faster and heal when submerged into ink, and they can only shoot the ink when they're out of it. As this new mechanic was implemented, Nogami felt that the appearance of rabbits shooting and submerging ink kind of didn't fit the gameplay all too well. The other team was then tasked to come up with different designs for replacing the rabbits, which you can see here. Some of them do resemble squid-like creatures, but other designs are entirely different. We can see here a character in what appears to be a heat suit, two different squid designs where one is a squid with legs while the other one is a human slash ink hybrid that kind of resemble the inklings, and an anthropomorphic blob character design that, to me at least, looks like a type of gummy bear. The final design that they would decide on is the one based on squids that can transform into people and would later be given the species name, Inklings. In order to keep the game active and to get others to keep coming back to it, the team decided to release patches that would add content over time, rather than dump it all at once on launch day. The team would finally reveal their new shooter and IP now called Splatoon. The trailer gives the impression that most of the stages shown off are relatively complete, but there are various differences when comparing their final game counterparts. Though, in order not to confuse everyone, I'll be picking apart the trailer and separating it by the stages they show off. Let's start off with the very first stage that was ever shown off and played on, Urchin Underpass. Unfortunately, the Underpass doesn't have that many differences between the released version or even the E3 playable demo as far as I can see. Before some of you note that the plaza of the level has changed, or that the corridors are bigger in the final version, 
The level itself got a huge makeover and redesign after patch 2.0.0 of Splatoon. The actual released version of Urchin Underpass, as in the one that was playable up to patch 2.0.0, has little differences when compared to the trailers and demos. Let's head to Wally Eye Warehouse where the employees are hard at work transporting cargo around in the early version of the stage. The moving boxes were going to be the main stage hazard and, as indicated by this jumping inkling, it's possible to ink and climb these moving boxes for better vantage points. It seems that all of the terrain is climbable in this stage as, later on in the trailer, this inkling climbs the shipping container which becomes unclimbable in the final version. Let's follow the cargo to the shipping place and the next stage of the trailer, Salt Spray Rig. You might notice right off the bat that the rig is looking rustic and plain during the early development. On that note, the entire stage is designed differently as we can take a better look at the layout of the stage from the gamepad screen shown here. Let's compare it to the final Salt Spray Rig layout. One of the major additions it seems was that these two platforms were combined together by the released version. They did remove these slopes that would have led to the higher tiered platforms, which we could see as this inkling passes by them in the trailer. There's also a lack of solid walls in the early version, as indicated with this shot where a player makes his way to the main platform. Instead of the solid walls, what you get is a bunch of crosswire fences, which don't provide the best cover. That's about all the stages the trailer shows us. Actually, that was a lie. There is one more stage in this trailer that I completely forgot to talk about till editing this video, and it's the early version of Erewhon Mall. So let me go over the few differences. First and foremost, the trailer gives us a good look at the stage when this inkling super jumps to another location. We can see that the great platforms were connected at one point, and as indicated later on in the trailer, it would have caused some crazy shootouts to happen due to inklings being able to shoot above and below the platforms. We can also see that the corridors of the stage were designed differently, with ramps leading to the connecting great platforms. Lastly, the advertisement glass uh, showcase thing in the middle of the stage is completely missing from the center point of the stage. Okay, that's all I have to say. Back to the video. But there are two more things to note in this trailer. This inkling in Salt Spray Rig is using a charger type weapon that doesn't resemble any of the released weapons. In fact, this weapon goes unused and is still inside the game's files. Although it's not actually inside the files of the actual game. You'll see what I mean later. The last thing is the early version of the ink strike that's fired at the end of this trailer. The attack, or the animation at least, is bigger and resembles more of an explosion rather than a rising inferno animation in the final game. Before moving on to the single player trailer, we're gonna deviate to two videos that captured the Splatoon demo at E3 2014. Firstly, straight from the Nintendo Treehouse livestream, we could see the early version of the icon when somebody would be super jumping to. It seems that these indicators would be surrounding you whenever someone would choose to super jump to your location. The final game super jump notifies you with this arrow banner and has a similar looking indicator that's in a circular pattern rather than in a swirly pattern. The staple Splatoon song that plays when there's only one minute remaining called Now or Never is completely different to its final counterpart. How about taking a listen? Before I play it though, let me just say that the footage captured both the sound effects and the music of the demo, so it might be drowned out a bit by the sound effects. Anyways, let's take a listen to that track. A bit of a tone shift, ain't it? The music sounds more urgent and panicky compared to its final counterpart, which is upbeat and cheery. Let's sink down through the sewer grate to the single player trailer, where some single player campaign differences can be found. But first, a bit more changes to the multiplayer. The sinkling over here is holding her roller a bit differently than in the final version of the game. They also show an early version of Camp Triggerfish that has this early platform that you can fall through, compared to its final version, which is a solid wooden platform. 
The turf war being held right now has an inkling holding a classic squiffer rifle, but the sub weapon he throws isn't the point sensor. The weapon formerly had burst bombs as their sub weapon instead of the point sensors. Alright, that's enough of the multiplayer stuff. Let's swim over to Octo Valley for differences in the single player campaign. The first thing we can spot in the trailer is this cut Octo enemy. Some have suggested that this enemy is an early version of the Octo Sniper. While I admit its design parallels that of the Octo Sniper, it's impossible to say for sure that this design is a beta Octo Sniper or an unused enemy in general. We then cut to Captain Cuttlefish coming out of his grade, but the back of him doesn't resemble Inkopolis Tower or even the plaza itself. The appearance of the area resembles some sort of alleyway similar to where Spike is located in the final game. Some of the art in the concert art book even depicts the captain in this alleyway, which is probably where it originates from. Getting back to the captain, here he is in some sort of area. We can't really see where exactly he is because the camera is zoomed in. Most agree that the captain is in a level of some sort, meaning he was going to appear in a level somehow. However, I think it's also very possible that the main hub of the single player game, Octo Valley, could have been designed differently at this point in the development. Still, those are just two theories and it's impossible to say for sure from this screenshot alone. Players could have taken more hits than in the final game as there are 5 health bars instead of 3. And while this shot doesn't tell us anything that's truly obvious about it, there is something that goes unused here. Notice the orange sunset background of the level? It seems that the background was used multiple times for different levels throughout the trailer, despite it never appearing in the final game at all. The trailer also contains what looks to be an 8-bit running gun minigame for a few seconds. We're not exactly sure if this scene was going to be made into a full-fledged minigame, or if it was just made for the trailer itself, so there's not much to talk about here. Before the trailer ends, we get the first looks at the elite enemy of the single player campaign, the Octolings. This Octoling here isn't wearing her normal gear though. For one, she's wearing what would become moto boots in the final game. Her legs are also covered with armor plating, and the belt on her belly is missing. Let's not dip into the game files just yet. I want to focus on the huge amount of concept art that was drawn up while the game was in development. Despite the amount of beta elements in the trailer, there's a ton of early ideas and designs for characters and stages that never got past the drawing board, and I found a lot of the concepts interesting. These sketches and drawings are from the Art of Splatoon book, which I highly recommend you get if you're a Splatoon fan. Most of the concept art spans over multiple pages of the book, so I'll be organizing the art by topic. First off, let's talk about some of the gear you can buy at the shops. And since we just came from the single player trailer, why don't we talk about Agent 3's hero jacket? The jacket itself is comparable to the final version, with the exception of the trinkets at the back. The early design had this fish hook, which, according to the book, was believed to attract the opposite sex. To me, it's a weird little statement to add in, but I won't deny that it's interesting to say the least. The ski jackets and clog shoes are two pieces of regular gear that had some early design differences. The ski jackets were originally going to have hoods. On the other hand, the clogs have multiple early designs. Some of them had radically different designs and color schemes like this one with eyes or this other one that has the American flag color scheme. The gear might have had radically different designs, but so do the multiple characters of Inkopolis Plaza. Many characters went through various design concepts, none more so than the Squid Sisters themselves. For example, there are many early rough sketches of the pop duo that don't even look close to their final counterparts. These range from a duo wearing palette swaps of green and black colors, to these designs of roller skating cheerleader squids holding mics. There are three very specific rough sketches that I want to focus on though. This sketch shows us the origins of the Squid Sisters color scheme, though the colors are switched with Callie being green and Marie being pink. There's also this sketch that depicts the origins of their iconic hairstyles, with Callie having her iconic long twin tails and Marie with her sideswept bob style haircut. Right next to it is another rough sketch, but it's a sketch of them doing an early version of their iconic Stay Fresh pose. More early designs as to what the iconic pose would be for the duo are on this page as well. Back to the Squid Sisters themselves, they have many early designs for their outfits. First up on the list is what the book refers to as the Squid Suit design. The design is notable because this design would be the basis for Marie's final design. This page contains some more early outfit designs, such as these dress designs on the bottom of the page. There's also uh, this Playboy bunny outfit for... I think that's Marie, but I'm not really sure. Anyways, moving to the middle of the page, you can see on the left there's another dress design, and I think that's a mechanic outfit on the right of it. 
In the middle contains Callie wearing that roller skating cheerleader outfit from the earlier sketches, as well as a Marie variant of the outfit. The very top of the page contains this concept art of Callie that, according to some of the translated notes, was scrapped because it made Callie look too much like a player. These final two designs are the closest in terms of comparing their final outfit designs. The only difference is that Marie's dress would basically become palette swapped, and the arrow pattern on their torso would become removed entirely and be replaced with pink and green spots. Lastly, but certainly not least, the logo for the Squid Sisters has an early design. This design has two hands on the sides and what looks to be a squid with hair band colors of green and purple in the middle of the logo. Okay, that's enough about the pop stars. Let's take a look at some early designs for the grandpa. Captain Cuttlefish has several early designs, one of which is literally just a cuttlefish on a body. The others are ones where I think he's supposed to be a hippie with a manhole cover on his back, and a design that heavily implies he was going to be a retired plane mechanic. Another character that had early designs is the owner of the Amorite shop, Sheldon. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure if these designs are early designs for Sheldon, or they're just newly designed characters. Either way, we could see designs of a pufferfish character and a shellfish character. The shellfish character specifically is described to have been a cool old man that's very fashionable and rides motorcycles. While not specifically an early character design, there were different concepts for where or how Judd would be sleeping in the plaza. These range from him sleeping in between orange construction cones, to him sleeping on the grass, to him sleeping on a pedestal that actually closely resembles Judd's final placement. However, my personal favorite early design is this one here, where Judd is sleeping on top of the Miiverse post box. Let's switch gears and talk about some early weapon designs. As you might have already noticed, this early blaster has a glass compartment filled with what I can assume to be paintballs. It could be inspired by one of those gumball water guns. The rest of the weapons in the book look pretty much identical to their final game counterparts, minus some little changes. The only weapon that doesn't seem to fit anywhere is this gun type weapon. From what we can see and according to the description of the book, the design of this gun is inspired by hair dryers. It's possible this gun was going to be a shooter or blaster type weapon. Early splat bombs were oval shaped and resemble more of an actual grenade, but this shape might look more familiar to Splatoon 2 players because it resembles the shape of the torpedo sub weapon in that game. Seekers had two different early designs. One of them is based on what looks to be an ATV, while the other one is designed as a boat. Finally, the Ink Strike has concept art that depicts it functioning a bit differently. It looks like the Ink Strike would have completely been stationary when you would activate and fire it. The final game's Ink Strike doesn't allow you for full movement, but it does allow for at least a little bit of movement. This early Ink Strike looks to be completely stationary because it can't be carried on the Inkling's back. The stages you were going to ink would have looked differently judging from some of the art for the various stages. Starting with the Bluefin Depot concept art first, there's only one concept that caught my eye. Apparently, there was an idea to use sinks and urinals as teleportation points. The art suggests that you would enter a urinal or a sink in squid form and pop out from a drain hole in another location. I can assume that these points can be used both ways, where if you enter a drain in squid form, you would exit from a sink or a urinal. Blackbelly Skate Park also had one notable thing about its concept art. The early design had a different stage layout with the team spawn points being at the same side of the stage. The focal point of the stage also has this coliseum area instead of that tall cylinder platform that's in the final game. The kelp dome is known to grow some of the vegetables of the Inkling world. This concept was taken further as you were going to be able to see plants growing in the stage itself. The gimmick with these furred zones is that the raised ground wouldn't hinder you from walking where plants are not growing. So that means that if plants were growing in the ground, your walking speed would be reduced in some way. Camp Triggerfish has the most differences between its final version and its concept art. The art depicts the camp as more of a wooden fortress type stage compared to its playground design in the final game. Actually, part of the concept art looks very similar to the playground set you can see in the background. This middle fortress building in the concept art did kinda get used because there is a part of the actual stage that bears similarities to it. Though the gates of the stage that were planned were going to be suspensive bridges leading to what I think is some sort of room with a blast proof door. The bridges would have probably been raised up or down when it was the last minute of the match. The room with the blast proof door could have also opened and shut, but 
I get the feeling that implementing that feature in Splatoon wasn't the best idea because it would be unfair or just break the game completely. There were other various early concepts that make the camp look like, well, an actual campsite. Most of these look like background elements to me, but this particular design is probably based off the previous fortress design from before. Before we head off the battlefield, there are two more things relating to these stages though it relates to none of them. Yes, I know that didn't make any sense, but I'ma just roll with it. For those of you who've never played the ranked mode, there's a mode called Rainmaker where you basically escort a player that's holding the weapon called, well, the Rainmaker, and whoever gets it to the designated platform on the opposite side first with it wins. The platform for the Rainmaker has two different concept designs for it. One of them is based off the Japanese Makoshi, a portable Shinto shrine used during special festivals. The other design just has the Squid Sisters logo on it. Though, it's important to note that the little index next to the design here mentions that the Squid Sisters design was probably never going to come to fruition and it was a mock-up for a flashy graffiti texture. The spawn points for the stages went through multiple designs that revolved around the concept of, well, ink. All early concepts of the spawn points had some sort of faucet where the inklings would spawn from, according to these illustrations. This concept on the far right in particular has a compelling spawning idea, where two fire hydrants would spray together as a spawning animation. The targets for the shooting mage at the Amor Knight store went through various design changes. First design that I noticed are the targets that look like anemones, which, according to the small description, shrink and eventually disappear when ink is shot at it. This pufferfish target over here would grow and eventually pop the more you shoot ink at it. Near the end of the book, there's one full page of concept art of what the Zapper Fish in the single player campaign might have looked like. I won't go over each design individually, but what I can say is that most of the designs are more round and ball like than the final game Zapper Fish. The reason for these ball like designs is probably indicated in this early concept art of the onward screen when you clear a level in the single player campaign. According to the concept art, the inkling would get the zapfish and roll it across his or her arms and back as if it was a ball. Then, they would spin the zapfish on their finger, like as if they were doing the animation for a battle victory with a bucket. Lastly, but certainly not least, there are storyboards of the original version of the cutscene when you meet and defeat DJ Octavio in the single player campaign. The introduction storyboard isn't all that different. The defeat storyboard has elements that we never see though. The first panel doesn't tell us a whole lot until we look at the note beside it. It describes that the player was originally going to probably super jump right into DJ Octavio. It's completely different than the final game's concept of ricocheting the giant bomb he launches at you. It could also imply that the original way of attacking him in general could be somehow launching yourself at DJ Octavio. It's only a theory though because the storyboard, nor the entire concept of the book, doesn't give any clear indication of how the final boss fight was originally designed. Moving on to the other panels, everything seems to basically follow the final game's cutscene until we get to the 10th panel. After the light fades, the core of DJ Octavio's ship expands and then collapses on itself, sucking in debris before it goes off in a giant explosion. After another fade out from light, memories of the single player campaign were going to flash one by one till it hangs on Agent 3's face. According to the little notes on the side, Octavia was supposed to show affection towards Agent 3 and then cut immediately back to Agent 3's actual face. As Octavia fades away, he says, this was fun, and ink starts splattering on the screen. This ending is more dramatic than the final version ending, where DJ Octavio basically says cross fade to black, but I do admit, I prefer this ending over the official one. Whew, we're finally done with the comp start, so let's ink a pad to the game's files to see what was left inside the game. And as per usual, if you guys want to see some of the stuff I don't talk about, such as this texture on the back of the in-game amiibo box, there will be a link in the description below. First up are some placeholder icons that are, well, not all that interesting to be honest. If a gear has no brand or icon associated with it, these two placeholder icons would take its place. Not all that exciting. This drawing of the Squid Sisters is located inside the files for the Inkopolis Plaza hub world. Its purpose is just to solely be a placeholder for the Jumbotron screen where they broadcast from. There's also one piece of unused music left inside the game. Let's take a listen.
Those of you that played the Global Test Fire demo might have recognized this song. That's because the song, internally named STRM underscore title, was used as the title screen music for the Global Test Fire demo. Who's ready to gear up? Let's take a look at these two pieces of unused headgear. First on the left are just regular stealth goggles you can buy in the actual game. The difference here is that the final version has a green light coming off the scopes. What's more interesting is the headgear that's on the right, which has the name Warrior Headdress. This is a headgear that is one star, has the quick super jump as its primary ability, and is obviously based off of real life Native American headdresses. I can imagine because of the connection to Native American culture, this headgear never got released and possibly won't ever be released in the games to come. This icon for the varsity jacket, or should I say the varsity hoodie, has drastically different color changes compared to the one inside the game. The jacket is in a grey and brown color scheme, complete with black buttons and a hood. The jacket could actually be seen in early screenshots of the Jelly Fresh store in the back racks. However, you can see that the camo zip hoodie has taken its spot. Its name suggests that this was either an early version of the varsity jacket, or a variation of the jacket itself. Next is the icon for the early version of the real sweatshirt. The color would change from grey to a prominent red in the final game, and because of that, the name had to obviously change. The early icon for the purple camo LS shirt is also in the game, and can be seen in early screenshots and video footage. The armband would change from yellow to orange in the final game. This shirt is named the White Puffer Tee, made by Firefin. The design of this shirt implies this was an early version of the Fugu Tee, with the main color of the t-shirt changing from white to black. Both this layered anchor LS shirt and these custom trail boots have the same differences. The layered anchor LS shirt would change from black to maroon, and the custom trail boots would be swapped from black and blue to pink and green. So that's the last of the gear in Splatoon itself, but we're not done with talking about unused gear just yet. Believe it or not, there are some Splatoon stuff left over in another game. Namely, the Wii U version of Super Mario Maker. So, let's jump over to those game files so that we can take a look at even more unused gear. Firstly, in the Super Mario Maker files, you can find the early icon for the Urchin's jersey. What makes it different to the file game's Urchin jersey? The lines of the jersey that change from white to green. And that's it. Are you used to colors changing yet? Because that's not the case with this early icon of the b-ball jersey. The jersey has different art behind the basketball of the shirt itself. The old version of the jersey has an arrow pointing upwards, while the two versions of the final game's jersey has rays coming off of the ball itself. Here's an early version of the basic jersey that you get when you first start the game. The most obvious difference of this early tee is that the logo is completely missing from it. This icon could be an early icon for the purple camo LF shirt. Its logo on the right side of the chest area is significantly larger, and it's wearing a yellow armband instead of orange in the final. This early icon of the striped rugby shirt has one little difference. The logo on the right side of the shirt isn't a Takaroka logo, like it is in the final. It might not be as clear as the final t-shirt, but it looks like the logo doesn't follow the regular pattern that's on the shirt. The early logo even has a swoosh at the end of it. It's possible this logo was a beta Takaroka logo, or perhaps a different brand logo entirely. The early icon of the vintage check shirt has two color scheme differences. For one, the stripes are colored turquoise and the buttons are colored red rather than white. The stripe pattern on the breast pocket also doesn't match the rest of the shirt, unlike the final version of it. This early icon could be an early version of the baby jelly shirt, or perhaps a variation of it. The early black squid eye icon tells us one thing about the shirt. The logo on the bottom of the Tentatech logo was different. However, this could also mean that the logo for the Tentatech brand was completely different as the final game shirt is basically copying the Tentatech brand logo. This early icon of the white tee also has an early logo. This might seem like an early version of the logo, but taking a closer look at the logo, it's actually the final logo of the white tee but just rotated slightly. Last of the early shirt icons is one for the samurai jacket, and the jacket is completely different from the final version. The door, or breastplate, has a different texture, and the haidate, or the skirt part of the armor, is colored blue instead of orange. The sode, or the arm plates on the side of the armor, are also textured to be more flat and plain looking than the final's rough shape. Sick of talking about gear yet? No? Well good, because I still have to go through the list of unused headgear. So let's get through them. First off, is the early icon for the gas mask. The icon itself is designed differently, with the main body of the mask being mostly white, and the three filters on the mask being in opposite sizes. 
These early versions of the retro specs have their bands colored blue instead of green seen in game. They're also tinted blue instead of being tinted black. This early icon for the studio headset actually has some history behind it. Besides the fact that the color originally had a great color scheme, you can see this headset being worn originally by the rabbits in this early screenshot of the game. Just like the samurai armor before it, the icon of the samurai helmet shows us a different design than its final version. The crest part of the helmet is more upright, and the foreplate of the helmet has different ornaments attached to them. Besides that, the entire shape of the helmet is basically the same. Here's, um, I think these are noise cancelers, but I'm not entirely sure on that. I think it's pretty obvious that the design of the headset is completely different, but the noise cancelers are the closest headset that looks similar to The original noise cancelers came attached with a microphone, and I think those are some sort of glasses attached to the headset too. Here's a radically different variation of the American football inspired tentacles helmet. The helmet is colored purple, and most notably, has added horns on the sides of it. Okay, bear with me, we're almost done with the unused gear. You just gotta get through the unused shoe icons now. Luckily, there are only a few that are notable, so let's get to it. Here's an early version of the iconic pink trainer shoes. The only notable difference is that the tag where the Tentatech logo should be isn't there. This logo could be a placeholder symbol or perhaps an early version of the Tentatech logo. Finally, there are two icons for variations of the low and high top shoes. Both of them are multicolored, mainly yellow and blue, and have hints of white at the tips of the shoe. <sighs> Finally, we're done with the unused gear. Before we get to the unused weapons and specials, we're gonna go back into the files in Splatoon because there are a couple lines of leftover text. So, you guys remember the multiple Splatfests that happened when the game was being supported, right? For those of you who don't know or never participated in one, Splatfests were basically themed turf war events where you would fight for the side you voted on. There were multiple Splatfests ranging from Cat vs Dog to Pokemon Red vs Blue. Well, the unused text actually relates to these Splatfests as they were going to be played should the other team have won in those Splatfests, like say for example, if Science won in the Art vs Science Splatfests. We only have the lines for the North American Splatfest starting from Art vs Science and onwards, but I won't be the one reading these lines. Let me pass it on to two guests I had today. <coughs> Because 
Now that the unused text is taken care of, it's finally time to talk about unused weapons and specials. Firstly, let me just say that there are unused weapons in the actual files of Splatoon, but most of them are testing weapons with no clear differences. I'll note some of the more quirky weapons though. Firstly, this .96 GAL shooter doesn't seem to shoot as far as its final counterpart, and the inkling holding it is walking slow, but not as slow as in the final game. The beta charger type weapons are all ridiculously long ranged, with even the classic squiffer being able to shoot at great distances. The Bamboozler 14 Mark 1 has the same shot length as the previous beta chargers, but this gun charges significantly slower than its final counterpart. The beta ink brush won't flail ink in an arc as it usually does. The ink brush seems to have an increase in distance in the ink that's shot from the brush, and it only shoots a single shot. In fact, a direct hit from the single shot can KO an opponent, almost as if this was a blaster. It leaves a super thin ink trail that I don't believe it's even possible to swim in. The roller weapons fling ink in very weird patterns. The regular splat roller fires ink in front of you and in four other directions. The dynamo roller flings ink in only three directions in front of you and has a reduced distance in terms of how far you can fling the ink. The carbon roller has a weird arc-like pattern for its ink fling and can KO an opponent when running over someone, unlike its final counterpart which can't do that. Okay. We're gonna hop back to Super Mario Maker's files because there are still some other unused weapons, sub-weapons, and even special weapon icons over in that game. So let's get to it. Since we've just talked about the rollers, let's continue that trend by looking at these early roller icons. Most of these are similar to their final counterparts, with their colors being the only difference. These three in particular seem to only be a variation of the Splat Roller, but this one over here looks to be an early design of the Dynamo Roller. Just like the rollers, all of these charger weapons look pretty much identical to each other with the outlier being this grey colored one. The color and even the different design of the charger makes this weapon almost look like a real sniper rifle. In fact, the charger is used in the E3 2014 trailer by this inkling that I've stated before. Finally, these are the different splattershot icons that were left over. Most of these are, again, just color variations of the same splattershot, except for this one which Let's be honest here, it's a straight up gun. It seems to be designed as a revolver and it could be based off those toy water guns that look like revolvers in real life, but I'm just stretching for an explanation. Let's move on to the sub weapon icons which don't have any color coding implemented in them. Considering that the weapon icons won't color themselves to whatever color the inkling is, there is a chance that these sub weapon icons were used during the rabbit beta version of Splatoon. Now while this early burst bomb might not be all that different, this suction bomb is extremely different from the bombs that the Inklings throw. The icon depicts a tennis ball instead of the familiar can shape we all know. It's very possible that this was a placeholder till they designed the actual bomb. The Squid Beacon was originally a plain white flag model, and the early Disruptor looks more like a real stun grenade rather than a chemical flask. Finally, the early flash wall isn't textured, and it's designed to shoot ink upward rather than downward. There are two icons for the Ink Zuka, with the only difference between the two being color variations. Other than that, there's nothing very much different compared to its final counterpart. The Ink Strike though, looks to be somewhat incomplete because it's just a simple rocket model. In fact, this rocket model looks similar to the concept art that was drawn up for this weapon. It's also lacking the tablet used for launching the rocket which makes me wonder how would an Inkling know where to fire it. The last of the unused special icons is for the Killer Whale or, as its internal name calls it, Big Laser. Instead of the weapon being something like a gigantic speaker or perhaps a literal big megaphone, it's just a recolored Ink Zuka icon. Somewhat disappointing, but it was probably a placeholder till they figured out how to design the weapon. Last but certainly not least, let's talk about what is the most known unused model in the files of Splatoon. And of course, I'm talking about the unused model of a playable Octoling. There are two models of the Octolings one of which is the familiar enemy version we see with the goggles. But there is one more model that doesn't have goggles on her. The used enemy Octoling model actually has inkling eyes as placeholders under her goggles, so the fact that this model has original eyes is telling to say the least. The model does have ink color changing hair and was constantly updated throughout Splatoon's lifetime, most notably adding in a mouth for losing animations. 
The model is very playable, as many Splatoon modding videos will show, and she even has her own version of the Kraken special, dubbed the Octo Kraken by fans. Originally, the only official glimpse of her was through Japanese Twitter and American Tablet Splatoon promo pictures. That changed in 2018, when Nintendo released the Octo Expansion DLC in Splatoon 2, finally giving the fans the chance to play as an Octoling. And so those were the beta files of Splatoon. Despite the premise being simple to understand, a lot went into the conceptualization and development of the game itself. Characters were changed, stages were redesigned, and weapons and enemies were cut in the process of trying to make a new game. I do admit that I wish some of these concepts would have come to fruition, such as the single urinal warp or the original storyboard for DJ Octavio's defeat. Luckily, some ideas did get passed on into Splatoon 2, but the original game still feels special to me. At the time, Splatoon felt like a new game with mechanics that you couldn't find anywhere else. And that's exactly what Nogami's team set out to make, a game that was new, fresh, and fun to play. With that being said, my name's Ninfan237, and remember to stay fresh! Hey, thanks for watching the video. Welcome to the end card where I will stutter and probably make this video longer than it already should be. Um, I'm gonna try and get through this as fast as I can. Um, so remember to like this video and subscribe if you aren't already. Uh, follow me on Twitter to see what I've been doing uh, these days or get my opinions on video games and anime if you're into anime. Uh, if you have a suggestion, if you have a game suggestion for another Beta Files episode, please comment down below. Uh, my list continues to grow as people continue to give me uh, to give me suggestions for games that I should do. And I pretty much am open to anything as long as there's actually something to talk about. As long as there's information about the game itself because sometimes games don't have information I can actually make into a video. Um, and if you find a mistake in my videos, uh, please comment down below about if you need to correct me or you, uh, you find a mistake, uh, because most people find mistakes in my videos and, um, not to mention, I'm only human and it's hard to get every little thing correct w when you're the only person working on these videos and these videos are stupidly long. Um, uh, one little quick short announcement. A buy me a coffee donation page will be opening up soon as voted on uh, the community tab in my YouTube channel. By the way, um, for those of you who actually voted, thank you for your input, uh, you guys. And um, it made me have better judgment on whether or not to open a donation page or not. So uh, thank you guys for your input. Um, but more information will be given sometime in the future when the world returns to normal. I'm Pretty sure most of you already know what that means, but if you don't, and because you're in the far future and you don't really understand what's happening right now, let's just say for the record that I- let's just say in order for me to not actually get demonetized because I can't really say what's happening, I'm waiting for everyone to be able to go outside because of a- because of a certain sickness that's going around. Let me just say that. I hopefully won't- Hopefully I won't get demonetized, but, um, let's just keep it at that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm waiting until, uh, we're able to actually go outside again. So, um, more information will be given sometime in the future whenever that happens. Um, so, anyway, so I'm going to be taking about, uh, so I'm going to be taking a break for about a month or two and perhaps make another Pac-Man Smash montage video and then start on the next beta files which I'm just gonna say right now it's Wii Sports and it's commenter requested because I didn't really know how to make a trailer for this video and also trailers kind of interrupt end card screens so yeah so yeah next uh, beta files it's gonna be Wii Sports and it's commenter requested um yeah um speaking of uh beta file videos um if you haven't seen the previous be beta files videos well uh they should be on screen right now uh so go check them out uh one's about new super mario brothers and the other one was a video about battle for bikini bottom and that should be about it so um remember to uh stay safe and healthy out there guys and uh my name's ninfan237 and i'll see you guys next time